in a very real sense, categories natural or moral overlap in God. But in our quest to understand God, it seems best to differentiate between natural attributes, uh, those attributes that are tied intrinsically to God's essence, right? The reason why we say they are natural attributes because those qu uh, qualities, character qualities, are intrinsically tied to God's essence, which he holds uniquely apart from any interaction with his creatures. It is so unique to God uh, apart from the creatures. Whereas moral attributes, right, those attributes which are also intrinsic to God, but which are mostly clearly seen through God's interaction with his creatures, right, uh, which can be even possessed by a finite way by men and angels. Right, the moral attributes, for example, we can be holy, we can be loving, we can be merciful, we can, so, but it is uh, it's in a finite way, right? Finite way we can have. So that's the reason we those attributes are called as moral attributes. So if we ask a question why uh, we say natural attributes, why? Because they are natural attributes, because those attributes that are tied intrinsically to God's essence, right? Uh, it, to God's nature, to his essence. And, and it also uniquely apart from any interaction with his creatures. All right. But moral attributes are not like that. So let's look at our uh, first natural attribute. Remember? We talked about his being, right? Being. Uh, there are, you know, when we look at uh, the being, sorry, I wanted to show you one more time and then we will go back. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, we, what we are going to look at, we are going to look at being, knowledge, power. In being, we are going to look at two. Right, that's what we are going to do. Uh, omnipresence and eternity. Okay. Omnipresence of God. God is independent, infinite, and immutable. Remember, these are summary attributes, but now we are going to use those three to qualify other attributes. God is independent, infinite, and immutable with respect to his being. That is, that is, he is omnipresent. What do we mean by that? He is not limited by space, and he is eternal. When we say God is eternal, that is what we understand. He's not limited by Space, that means he is omnipresent. And God is not limited by time. That means he is eternal. Right? God is not time bound. There is, there is no time. Now, I should ask, when, when did the time begin? You know, when did the time begin? Anyone? The, after creation, the first day. Right, right. The it just began on the first moment of creation. Right, the first second it begins. Second is for our understanding. Right, the way that we measure time, or millisecond, whatever it is. Right, at the moment of of create creation, the first moment. Right, that we call the the time. Okay, again, we use the time, right? Because we, we are so limited that there is no other way we can explain it, right? So time has a beginning, but God is not limited by time. So let's look at the first one, uh, omnipresent, that he is not limited by space, right? God is not limited by space. 
Okay. Uh, yes. Definition. Definition of omnipresence. By omnipresence is meant that God transcends spatial limitations. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, God transcends spatial limitations. So just think about space. Uh, remember, space is something God created. Right? If you really study uh, Genesis, you will read. All right? So God transcends spatial limitations and and also is present simultaneously and eternally in all places with the whole of his being. Right? That's a mouthful of words. A lot of qualifications. Again, okay. Okay. A lot of qualifications used there. We need to put our mind, right? Concentrate. Think once again what we mean by omnipresent. He transcends all spatial limitations, right? God is not limited by any space, right? God is not limited by this room. I am, all right, this is a hall, and I am limited by this hall. I am not there in my house. I'm limited by a space, but God transcends all spatial limitations and is also present simultaneously. You know, simultaneously means same time, right? Same time. This is uh, 9 13 now here, and God is here. Same time. God is in Sri Lanka, God is in Nepal, God is in uh, Bhutan. Uh, God is in U.S. same time, right? Simultaneously and eternally, right? Uh, that means uh, even in the future, even in the future, it is going to be the same. In all places, again, with the whole of his being. That is interesting, right? Now we will, we will uh, slightly unwrap that one. Some distinguish. The terms omnipresence, um, that God is everywhere in the universe with all of, his, all of his being, with immensity. Some say, uh, you know, they try to distinguish these two terms. Right? What is immensity? It's a theological term. Okay? That God transcends spatial limitation of his universe. Okay, but most of the audience today use the term interchangeably. So please get in your mind the word omnipresence or immensity. These two words are, you know, uh, most probably these are the same. So um, what, uh, some people try to differentiate, uh, for, but it is hard to understand uh, when we say, when they differentiate, they say, you know, God, right, God, Immense God transcends all the spatial limitation of the universe. So um, God transcends the spatial limitation of the universe. Uh, we, this is hard for us to understand because uh, we need to ask the question: What is the limitation of space? What is the edge? Of, sorry, again. Okay. Uh, what is the edge of the universe? Do we know? Do we know the edge of the universe? Right? It is, you know, is there, is there, you know, at the end, is there, at the end of the universe, there is some kind of wall and God uh, spatially overcomes and you know, transcends all. See, it's hard for us to explain, right? If you really think some of the terms that we use. So, uh, some people try to differentiate. They, they say omnipresence, that God is everywhere in the universe with all of his being and immensity is that he transcends the spatial limitations of his universe. But I don't think we need to make that much different uh, differences here because I, I believe that these two are same. 
that, uh, you know, as the definition says, God transcends spatial limitations and so is present simultaneously and eternally in all places with the whole of all of his being, right? With all of his being. So that is the way I see the omnipresence. Now, I know that you know, the, the problem is when you, when you don't learn theology, right, uh, it is easy to understand something, right? Because, well, usually what every, everything is taught in the church is omnipresence, means God is everywhere, right? But now when you go into theology and when you begin to discuss theology, then it be, becomes more complex. Because now you, you are introduced to, to a new word, maybe immensity, right? And it becomes complex, but it is good to be like that because it helps us to think. Right, you know a word that you often hear, omnipresent. God is every God is here. That's what we simply say. But but it also says that God transcends all spatial limitations. Right, uh, there is no limitation for God because we we say you know God is independent, infinite. Right, there is no limitation for His presence in anywhere. Okay. Now let's look at the biblical proof, right? It is interesting, uh, biblical proof. Uh, here is a, a great verse where Solomon, uh, which, you know, First Kings chapter eight verse, um, eight verse um, uh, twenty-seven. Will God really dwell on earth? Right, the heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. Wow. Highest heaven cannot contain you. Remember? So this is, this passage actually, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, we, we read this passage you know, when, during the uh, building of the temple, right? The Why this prayer was there? This prayer was there simply because heathen gods, heathen gods, create temple to house their God. House their God. You know, uh, you know, we know that in our culture, the, you know, there are a lot of incidents this way, right? Um, there, are, there, are, there are priests who would house a God in, on a tree. Usually Benian trees are used for that, right? You know, they house a God and, and they house a God in a temple. And so, uh, we, you know, here in First Kings, you have someone prays, you know, there is no place uh, that uh, cannot contain, that can contain God. Heaven or highest heaven. Let's look at the next verse. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 34. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? He declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth? He declares the Lord. That is so interesting, right? So, uh, you know, the way this verse is used is interesting. Right? Am I only a God nearby? Not a God Far away? What do you think about me? Can anyone hide in secret places that I cannot see him? Declares the Lord. Is there any secret place? And then this famous words, you know, that most, um, people may not have thought is used. Right? Do I not fill heaven and earth? Do I not fill heaven and earth? All right, Psalm 30, 139, verse 7 and 7 and 9, 10, 7 to 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Wow. Psalmist is speaking. Hmm? Where can I go from your spirit? It, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in dabs, right? Uh, 
uh, some you will read some translation would say if I make my my bed in Sheol, right? Sheol is the word for Hades, right? Or or you know, as in King James Bible you would see hell. If I have my bed in the depths or in Sheol, you are there. If I rise on the wings of heaven of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Right. So you have a song now, English, a beautiful song. Right. He will hold me fast. Him actually. He will hold me fast. A wonderful song to sing. So look at these three words, right? Um, you, you know, Solomon would say, heavens and the highest heaven cannot contain you, right? Next one, do I not fill the heaven and the earth? Hmm? And here you will see, uh, if I rise, okay, if I settle the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. That means, so the, these three verses are enough for us to learn this doctrine of uh, omnipresent, that he is everywhere. Now, all right, so far we simply looked at what it is. Now we need to look at some qualifications, right? Qualifications are necessary so that we have, you know, we will uh, uh, put a fence around our understanding of this doctrine. Number one, Omnipresence does not mean that God is everything and everything is God. All right. Who, who believes this? Who believes that God is? Huh? Any? Uh, Hindus? Hindus believe. Yeah. All right, uh, that is a big idea, right? God, you know, so God is have the, the, it is it is easy it is easy uh, for them to maybe this you know it is easy for a person to be deceived, right? The idea of God, they say God is everywhere, right? Yeah, God is everywhere. You you believe? I believe God is everywhere. So that means God. God is everywhere. God is in us. Is God in us? Yes, God is in us. All right. So then God, God is everywhere and God is everything. So God is in the tree. God is in all the inanimate objects. So uh, therefore, it's, uh, if everything, God is everywhere and in everything, then why don't, there is nothing wrong to worship that one. Because God is in, in them, right? So that is their logic. And uh, therefore, some people would say God, everything is God. Pantheism. Now, what we need to understand here, right? Uh, God fills the universe. Right. That is right. Because we, we already, already looked at this verse, Jeremiah. What is Jeremiah says? Uh, Do I not fill the heaven and earth? Right? So, so, if that is the case, God fills the universe, but not in a physical sense. Not in a physical sense, but in a metaphysical sense. Why? Because why God is not, God doesn't fill the universe in a physical sense. Why? Anyone? Why God doesn't fill the universe in a physical sense? It's easy, but just think. He, because he is, God, God is a he's spirit. Much bigger than. Oh, okay. He's much greater. He's much bigger than the universe. Okay. Because, because he has created it. Okay. All right. Like, <laughs> it is, it is like in the book of, book of Acts, it says... Uh, you know, God, God is the creator of the universe and you cannot, you know, make put him into a temple that is made by man. Right. So he's much greater than the universe. Yeah. And of course, the, I think somebody else also said, uh, see, it, God fills the universe in a metaphysical sense. 
not a physical sense. Why? Another thing is that God is a spirit. God doesn't have a body. God doesn't have a body. God is a spirit. Right? But he is a, the difference between other spirits and God's spirit is that God is an infinite spirit. Right? So, no physical entity is God. Though God sometimes chooses to manifest himself through physical entity, yes. With his, by, you know, yesterday we were looking at the hermeneutics about God's fingers. And God rolled with the fingers. Does God have fingers? God doesn't have fingers. Right? Uh, God, how can uh, God, God hears with his ear? Does God, has God, uh, does God have ears? No. But yes, so we talked about anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. And then we talked about yesterday, zoomorphism. What? You know, attributing animal parts to God, not only human parts, but animal parts, where you will see he will cover you under his wings. But does God have wings? No, right? So what we need to understand is that God has no physical body. No physical body. He is spirit. So that is one thing. But omnipresence means that uh, more than that, God is a spirit being, right? We have uh, other spirit be incorporeal spirits exist right and demons and angels they don't also don't have bodies but these are not rightly these are not rightly uh, is described as omnipresence though they are invisible these entities are in some sense localized right for example you know if you see you know there is uh, we read about Gabriel was not able to come to Daniel with an answer to prayer. You know, they are limited. So the difference between angels, demons, or, and God is that God is an infinite spirit. Right? A spirit that has no boundaries, no limitations. Whereas angels are not like that. Okay? So, uh, we say God fills the universe. God is everywhere in a metaphysical sense. Not in a physical sense. Okay. Next qualification. Omnipresence does not mean that part of God is in one place. And part of him is another. Okay, maybe God's hand is here. Uh, the other hand is somewhere else. No. Right? That he is thinly spread about the universe. No. No. He is everywhere present in his whole being. Right? In his whole being. Okay? So that is something we need to understand. It's not that half is there, not like that. Again, again, I know that you, you, we have a brain that we always somehow, our brain, brain takes us to limit God with his physical body. That's a problem. So, so like God is everywhere. God is everywhere. So that means how do we, how do we explain, again, our thought will go and, and compare God as a physical being. It is very difficult for us to compare a spirit being in a metaphysical sense. So, if it is, meta, if it is a physical sense, then God cannot be, God cannot be everywhere with the whole of his being. If, it's, if, it, if it is in a physical sense, God cannot be everywhere with the whole of his being, but it is in a metaphysical sense. The next qualification, omnipresence does merely mean that 
the evidences of God's presence are everywhere. All right? Evidences of God's presence are everywhere. His being is everywhere. Not just his laws and operation. God's being is everywhere. Right? It simply means that God, evidences of God's presence are everywhere. So that means his being is everywhere. The next one. Omnipresence does not mean that. All right. Another caveat. Does not mean that God manifests himself uniformly throughout, the, throughout his entire universe. It does not mean that God manifests, right? Manifest uniformly. No, not necessary. God in all of his being is everywhere, but it doesn't mean that he manifests himself uniformly. For, in, for, for instance, he does not dwell on earth as he does in heaven. Right? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Why, why, what Jesus, how did Jesus start? My, our Father in heaven. Why? Why not Father on earth? Right? God dwells in heaven. What does that mean? It simply means, so here's a caveat. It does not mean that God manifests himself uniformly throughout the universe. Right? The way that uh, he manifests in heaven is not the same way that he manifests in, on earth. Now, here's a, another problematic statement now. Right? Um, which, which is very problematic for many people. But uh, as we go... Uh, in our future studies, we will have more clarity. Uh, here's a point. He's not in the wicked. He's not in the wicked in the same sense that he is in the believers. Any problem? He's not in the wicked in the same sense that he is in the believer. Now, what I'm saying here is the point that God is in the wicked. Now that means now this is this is this has got some consequences, right? That consequences is that we believe that God God dwells in us. Hmm? I'm saying God dwells in the wicked also. Okay, but I'm saying so that means. Uh, the way I see this dwelling of the Holy Spirit may not be the way that usually what people describe and explain. Imagine, imagine for many preachers, Holy, you know, God is limited in that God cannot, God's presence cannot be there in unbelievers. God's presence cannot be there in unbelievers. That is what most of the people teach, right? So that means this is going to be slightly different, right? Um, because uh, <clears throat> you know, it is it is a it is a, a problem, right? Um, so you know, some people would explain uh, uh, by looking at these words. That, uh, you know, for example, John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 17. Remember, uh, you know, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit was, was uh, with the disciples. And sometime later, he would be in the disciple. Right? You know that verse? 14, 17. Uh, but I am saying, you know, whatever may be your explanation of that words, because uh, because a lot of people have, you know, they dance around that words much, right? Um, that means, you know, 
the, for, for example, the idea is that, you know, uh, many dispensationalists, you know, I am a dispensationalist, actually, but many dispensationalists believe that uh, uh, there was no indwelling in the Old Testament. Right, and the, one of the, 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 the one of the key words that they use to prove the idea that there is no indwelling in the Old Testament is this verse. Actually, it says that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit began only on from the day of Pentecost. I don't think that way. I don't think uh, there are reasons. I and I am and, and the way that I would explain that was a little different. But anyway, that we will uh, look at that later. Uh, I am I am saying no way. This is not. Not talking about God's, you know, it's, it's not, cannot, you know, the indwelling, indwelling cannot be explained by spatial sense. If that is what people explain, then there is a huge problem. Huge problem. All right? Cannot be explained that way. All right? I, I would say it's much more relational in sense, the way that I see indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all right? So, anyway, we will explain that, you know, I'm, because I'm not here to explain uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit right now, because we are going to look at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in detail future classes. So, so I would say uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, keep all our explanations on that later. But I'm saying, at least, God is everywhere, right? God is everywhere with the whole of his being, there is no space that you can limit to God, which means you cannot even limit God in an unbeliever. But I would say the way that God manifests throughout the universe, not uniformly, that means God doesn't manifest, even though God with the whole of his being is on the earth and in heaven fully, but the way that he manifests his presence is different, right? We, when we say Father in heaven, that is a place God's presence is manifested more. That, that way, God's presence is not manifested on earth. Similarly, I would say same kind of difference. The way that God manifested to a believer is different and an unbeliever is different. God, yes, God is there in an unbeliever. You cannot, you cannot, as you know, um, uh, limit God in that way. But it, the, the way that God is there in a believer, the way that God is in, a, in, in an unbeliever is completely different. All right? Further in point about, uh, the point about, well, further in the point about, we note also that God does not displace Anything in his being. Right? God does not displace anything with his being. Uh, storms. God is where everything else is. Right? God does not displace anything with his being. Right? So the idea is that uh, God is everywhere. All right? And God does not move something away so that he will not be there anymore. God doesn't. Right? So therefore, uh, God is where everything else is. God even does not move anything. Remove anything where so that he will not be there anymore. No. God is where everything else is. So, uh, these are the qualifications. So now that when we look at the qualifications, it is more complex sometimes, but it is good to be so that you have much more better understanding of, of the omnipresence of God. Now let's look at the objections. How can God be in hell? <laughs> well, who ever thought to that way? Uh, that we will ask this question that God will be God is even in hell. Of course, we saw Psalm uh, 138. We also saw, but if you Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 also indicate that. So does is God in hell? Right? 
No, we, because we thought God is only in heaven. Or maybe maybe sometime he comes to the earth. That's what the deism would say. You know, deistic idea that God sometime, and you know, there is an encounter you know, with his creatures. So he comes sometime, you know, that, that uh, electric shock happens to some people and uh, they are illuminated by the encounter with God. That's what deism said. But the God of the Bible, if you now we look at, there is no place that you cannot limit God, then that means God has to be in hell, right? Okay, now how do we explain? How do we explain this one? The second death, answer, second death, which confines the unbeliever to hell, right? Is defined as the, as the permanent separation of human soul from God. Right? Remember? It's called as what? Second death. Why? So that means there is a first death. What is the first death? What is the first death then? Physical death. Not necessarily. Not, not, not physical death. Separation of the soul from the body. No, that is, that is physical death. What is the first death? You know this. Oh, Adam, uh, the sin. Spiritual. Yes. What is spiritual death? What is spiritual death? What is spiritual death? Separation from God. Right. Separation. You, know, you, as a being, is separated. Right? Separated from God. But this is a temporary why it is temporary there is there is possibility of redemption right it is temporary it is temporary there's a possibility of redemption for the soul but through jesus christ through the death of jesus christ so uh, we died spiritually and physical death actually is the is the result of what uh uh, result of spiritual death, right? It is just consequences of that. So the reason why Bible calls a second death is, is because right here now we have the permanent separation of the human soul from God. The, if the first spiritual death is a temporary, the second death is what? Permanent. Right? That's how we need to see it. That's the reason Bible calls it that as second death. In one of the most significant torments experienced in hell, all right, listen carefully, one of the most significant torments experienced in hell is the withdrawal of God's influence from the soul. Hmm. You, you understand, that means... See, if you really know the nature of human being, you know, human being, and if you really know the depravity of human, human being, see, uh, we have, every unbeliever has the capacity to commit the heinous crime that a person can commit. Every unbeliever has the capacity to commit the heinous crime that a, a human being can ever commit. That means the next one, in a, you know, the next door, your neighbor can become a Hitler or a Bin Laden. But why they don't do, why they don't behave like that? It is simply because of God's work of grace in their soul, which we call it as common grace, right? Um, uh, you know, sometimes we call, also call it as noetic, noetic effect of sin, right? It is the restraining work of God in the human soul. All right, so one of the most significant torments experienced in hell is the withdrawal of God's influence from soul. 
However, God is not actually absent from hell. He, he is not subject to its torments, of course. God is not subject to the torments of hell. But his metaphysical presence is there such that he oversees eternal operations of hell. No hell-bound creature, however, will ever have the pleasure of fellowship with God. Yes, it is God who operates hell. It is, it is not as if you know, God creates a hell, right? And, uh, and a fire uh, that will burn, you know, like a sun, you know, burns forever. And what happens? And he put all this Satan and all the people inside and he throw the hell outside. So they, it, it just works by its own. And that's not the way. That's not the way. God is the one who operates hell. Right? God is the one who operates hell. So uh, you cannot separate God in that way. Right? Um, so it's not like God lock, locks up all this. All, all the demons, Satan, and, and wicked, uh, wicked people or unbelievers and throw it away. No, that's not the way. All right? So, you know, the greatest to... The, all right. The greatest to pain, the greatest to pain is that... The greatest to pain for an unbeliever in hell is that God is there. That is the greatest to pain. Right, the, you know, the greatest pain for an unbeliever is that God is not even removed from hell; that He sees it, He experienced, and and that lost opportunity he, is going to haunt him for eternally, and it is it is He because He is going to suffer the consequences. Right, all right. Anyway, so how can God be in hell? Yes. You know, God of the Bible, yes, he is in hell. Maybe the way that you think, the way that you have defined God probably could be different, different God. Now, here's another one. <clears throat> one more objection. You know, one more, um, yes, uh, objection, actually. How can an omnipresent God be described as drawing near, right? In this, we say he draws near. When we draw near to him. All right, how can that happen if he's here? If he's here, how can that happen? Now, it's not not, not a big way, but let, let's look at it again. It's not a big question to answer. God is described in terms of being near or far away, should not be taken in a spatial or locative sense. <laughs> if God, remember, we already just read, you know. Uh, not only am I a God who is far away, am I only a God who is near? Am I not a God also who is far away? Right? We remember? Um, what did we read? Hmm. Yeah, here, Jeremiah. Look at this, Jeremiah 23, 24. Am I only a God nearby and not a God far away? See? So, how do we explain that one? Don't take it in a, should not be taken in a locative sense. Nor, however, should it be understood in an existential sense. Right? Existence. Existential sense. As though his presence may be felt. You know? You know because I know that, you know, people preach this way, you know? Feeling. It, Right, uh, or otherwise known by extra uh, sensory means. That's not the idea. Well, of course, a lot of people anger on this one feeling of God, feeling of God's presence. Right, that's not the idea. The idea is God's drawing near should be understood in the Hebrew sense of coming near for blessing or judgment in the hebrew sense 
when God comes near, there are only there are two ways that word is used. It's used for either blessing or judgment. In the case of the former, drawing near then is an expression of divine approval, favor of blessing. And if God is moving himself away, means it is judgment. When God says, I am moving away, simply means I'm going to judge you. When I come near, means it is, it is for blessing. Now, um, there is an, the, uh, another, uh, I think I need to tell that also here. Otherwise, we may, uh, uh, you know, I may not clarify everything. You know, you know, the, you know, we have in the psalm, we have this commandment, draw near to God, right? Draw near, draw nigh unto him. Well, what does that mean? Draw near to him. Can anyone draw near to God? Can anyone, ex can anyone say what does that mean? Draw near to God. If this is not God is drawing near, but this is, this is asking us to draw near to God. What does that mean? Anyone? To go in the presence of God. Like. Okay. Again, problem. We are in the presence of God. Right? We are in the presence of God. So, anyone? Okay. Now, I would say it's not, it, it means recognizing. Well, um, uh, this is the way I, I would explain this one. Now, I'm standing here, right? I'm standing here. And of course, in this hall right now, I know for sure there is no, uh, there's nobody else except God. I mean, there's nobody else in this room. But imagine that there is someone standing behind this curtain, right? I don't, I don't, I don't know that he's there. Or I don't realize that he's there. I th simply think that you know I'm just alone, right? So, uh, but he suddenly he comes and he touches me, and I, I I turn back. Well, I see him, right? God is everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. God is everywhere. But problem with us is that oftentimes we don't recognize that God is everywhere, that God is with us. We don't recognize. So drawing near to God, right? Drawing near to God is that uh, actually recognizing God's presence and, and developing our relationship based on that based on that right right uh you you learn to trust you learn to trust god recognizing that god is with you so i would use the word recognize uh for the idea of drawing near it's not some of course see um uh, we know that god is everywhere but we come to the church Right, and we say, you know, we come to the presence of God. That is right, because we now, when we come to the church, we we understand, we recognize more. God is everywhere. God was already here, but maybe that is a time that you recognize more of, you think more of God, and you do things based on your thinking of God as you go. Into. So that's how I say. Um, the word drawing near. Okay, so anyway, uh, so we looked at the objections and now let's look at practical values. Negatively, all right, all right. Now, what are the, what is the uh, practical values of uh, God 
is omnipresent, uh, negatively, one cannot escape God. Right? In a sense, you, you really, you cannot go away from the presence of God. You cannot. All what you can do is, you can forget the presence of God. And Jonah, what happened to Jonah was that the same. He forgot, you know, he wants to forget that idea that God is not only, not only in Nineveh, God is not only in Tarshish, God also is there in the belly of flesh. Number B, so, of course, positively, the believer can never be abandoned. You will never be abandoned, Psalm 139, or can be a dwelling place of God. You can be a dwelling place of God, positively. A believer can never be abandoned, and believer can be the dwelling place of God, right? So, um, and of course, uh, if you say that you cannot escape from God, that means you cannot hide, right? Can you hide? You cannot hide. You, you cannot hide in sin, thinking that no one sees, right? No. He's there. Okay, any question on this? We looked at, uh, we, we are a little slow because we wanted to explain it. So, any question on the omnipresence of God? Omnipresence of God. No. Okay. Um, I have a little bit. <laughs> Uh, regarding um, the God presence uh, presence in the unbelievers life also uh, just huh. a little bit clarification because uh, <clears throat> I have a question why he is presence like his presence is there in unbelievers life hmm. what is the what is the reason because they haven't believed uh, him yet. Right. So, okay. First of and, all, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I think you got my question, yeah? Right, yeah. So, okay. Why God's presence have to be there? Uh, my answer to to that word, number one would be is that because God is God, right? He, he cannot limit uh, unbelievers like that. Right, but but uh, we always talk about God's presence in the believer in a locative sense or in a spatial sense. Um, it it is the problem of our usually it is a problem of our understanding. Can you just imagine if it is in a spatial sense that, you know, you are carrying a God? Can you just imagine that way? You are carrying a God wherever you go. You know, how, you know, how do you explain the creator of the universe so huge, so big, right? Who created the, created not only the earth, but created all the, you know, all the planets that we have, uh, sun and all the stars, right? Who is so big, so big in that you cannot even imagine how God, big God is. That just think this way. Think that uh, God is, that God you are carrying in your uh, inside. Just imagine uh, you know, then you will have a problem of, our, okay, oh, I am carrying that God. Is that the way to understand? So, in dwelling of God, uh, we need to, a little bit, we need to have clarification. So, I, that's what I would say. We will talk about that later. The difference between the, you know, the difference between an unbeliever 
and the believer is in the relationship. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Relationship. Right? Um, this indwelling that we talk about, it is actually connected to a relationship. Relationship. Right? The relationship that you have with God as a believer, as a child of God, an unbeliever doesn't have. Unbeliever doesn't have a relationship. Right? He doesn't recognize true God of the Bible. But, as I said, God has to work with every human being. Because the Bible says, say, God is a father. Oh, sorry. In the, in three sense. God is a father in three sense. Right? Number one. God is, a God is the father of all creation. Whether they recognize him or not. Because God is the, is the author. He is behind. He is the authority over everyone. Second. Uh, so this is, a, this is a general sense. Second, God is a father of all true believers. Right? This is, this is in a redemptive sense. Third, God is the father of Jesus Christ. It is, it is, uh, it is less slightly, it is much more different sense. God is not the father. You know, the, the relationship between Jesus Christ and the Father is not the same relationship that we have with the Father. It's not the same. It is, it is different. Right? For example, now if you take this all things, let's, let me also put, I'll show you some other way. God loves everyone, right? But the way that God loves His Son, that is Jesus Christ, is so different. God loves Jesus Christ, but that love, and this is only begotten, you know, some friends, the only son, the unique son, the only beloved. That's how Bible says. Now, second, God loves his children, right? God loves his children. That is all, you know, that, is, that talks about, um, talks about, uh, all who trusted in Jesus Christ, who, who are saved, right? Right, God loves, right? And therefore, you know, God sent his only son for the, you know, for the children, I would say. But are we here to say that God doesn't love unbelievers? Yeah, God loves unbelievers also. That is the reason, that is the reason that unbelievers are, living here on this earth. If God doesn't love them, everyone would, would have been in hell the moment they are born. Right? The moment they are born. But they see, the reason why people are here is simply the, 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 the compassion of God. It is the mercy of God. See, according to the word of God, there is you know, no one believer have any right to live on this earth. No right to live on this earth. So, does God love unbelievers? Yes, but in a different sense. Right? God's because um, how the love is manifested, uh, God's love is manifested two ways, right? Love is manifested by grace and mercy. Right? God, the law is manifested through grace and mercy. Yes. Unbelievers have what? Common grace. Right? A common mercy. Unbelievers have. That is the reason they are alive. They are, that's the reason they have food. They have clothing. They have money. Maybe more than believers have. 
Unbelievers have. Uh, the other day, you know, uh, I was pointed out about um, the footballer, <laughs> the wealth that he has, you know, the, the Brazilian player and the wealth that he has, right? Yeah. Unbeliever. I don't know whether he's a believer or unbeliever. I don't know who he is. But look at, I think he's an unbeliever. That's what my guess. It looks like, at least by looking at his life. And, and they're living, right? See, none of them have any right. But still, God loves them. God feeds them. God gives them rain. God gives them sunshine. So God loves that. So that means uh, the, God cannot withdraw himself from unbelievers. In any, or, so there is, uh, there is, God has, God maintains a kind of relationship. But that is not savingly. That is not a saving relationship. Right? So, yeah, so God has to control an unbeliever. God has to control every moment of his life, actually. Not even the something, every moment. So, I would say, my point is this, there is no relationship. A saving relationship is not there with an unbeliever. Like, God doesn't see you or God doesn't see an unbeliever like God sees you. That's what I would say. So God, but still God is there. God is there. God is there all over the world. Wherever, wherever the world is, wherever the universe is, God is there. Right? He cannot limit himself. He is there. He has to be there because God is the one who creates the history. He is the one who moves the world. He is the one who moves the history. So he has to be there. He has to be there everywhere. We cannot, uh, you know, if we look at, you know, for example, if you look at um, rulers, right? You know, rulers. Uh, you have uh, Putin comes. You have other rulers come. Maybe, you know, good rulers, bad rulers. But Bible says they're all God's servants. <laughs> Even Caesar. That's what Paul, Paul would say. You know, Caesar is God's servant. You need to obey him. So why? Because they, so the way God cannot, Distance himself from unbelievers. That is a wrong idea.